Asia. You're listening to Rethinking Climate. We are a youth-led nonprofit looking to understand the narrative behind climate change. Today, we are here with William Lamb. He's a research associate in the Working Group of Applied Sustainability Science. He's interested in human well-being framework for assessing climate change mitigation. He's an IPCC author and one of the authors of the UNEP Emission Gap Report, Researching Political Economy of Climate Change. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. So uh, I we met because I messaged you about one of your latest papers, although it was written in 2020, uh, Discourses of Climate Delay. So first of all, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the what is climate delay and how you got interested in such a topic, considering your background, which was something that we were discussing before recording. Mm -hmm. So what is climate delay? If you are observing um, public debates on climate change, you'll see that many people um, have differing opinions on climate change. Um, we've seen in the past that a lot of people have denied that climate change is actually happening, that it's human caused, that it will have bad impacts, that um, you know the climate scientists and communicators are untrustworthy. Um, these kind of these kind of approaches, and that's uh, it's really part of a whole um, field of misinformation, right? To try and downplay the need for action on climate change, to try and um, to try and deny that that we actually have to do something uh, about it. Now, climate delay doesn't really fit in any of those categories, right? It's not denying that climate change is happening. Uh, it acknowledges it. It's not denying that the impacts are bad. It says the impacts are bad, and we we ought to um, consider that. And it's not it's not really directly attacking attacking uh, climate scientists or communicators. So it does something else, right? So it downplays the need for for climate action, but it does it on more of a what we would call like a normative basis. So it says something like, um, it's not our responsibility to take action. It's somebody else. It's, it's, shouldn't, we shouldn't take these specific actions. We should rather focus on, on, on these, um, maybe less radical or, or more marginal actions, or it would suggest that climate policy is going to harm, um, uh, harm our society will harm poor people, especially. This is a major concern of, of these kind of discourses. And then finally, it might suggest that actually, even if we do take actions, um, they won't have much impact at all. So these are four sort of ways in which we distinguish climate delay and we sort of give it a name and say, well, you are seemingly arguing against climate policy, but you're not denying climate science. You're doing it more on this kind of um, delay type basis. So when we speak of the narrative and also our work towards climate action, what could be the consequences of that? I mean, we've seen it. 2020 was also the moment that the pandemic started. So now that several years have passed, how do you feel that we are approaching towards either resolving climate delay or trying to, you know, what could be the consequences of instead acknowledging that there's an issue since we've had for so long, and yet here we are still seeing that inaction is present? Yeah, I mean, I think here in Europe, where we are, um, those kind of arguments are quite powerful, right? Because climate denial is is um, a bit of a taboo now. So it's not, you don't tend to get invited on television when you're a climate denier anymore. Uh, but if you're an important politician in, you know, or a, a leader of industry or a reporter or, or, or whatnot, then you can have a discussion about climate policy um, in the public sphere. Now, one perhaps example of what's going on in terms of climate delay is the response to the energy crisis in Europe right now. So we've seen that, you know, gas is becoming a major topic, oil and, and um, the energy supply and how do we replace um, potentially cut off um, supplies from Russia. Um, now, climate delay strategy would suggest that, um, well, we approach this in the way that we have before, right? So we try and simply replace those fuels um, from somewhere else in the world. So we focus on a kind of transition, uh, continuing this transition towards gas. So gas is a more climate friendly fossil fuel. This is what we've heard a lot in the media, um, even before the crisis. So it's, it's better than coal, it's much more climate friendly. And so we should simply continue down that pathway and we should try and replace those supplies with new liquid gas terminals, with new infrastructure and so forth. Um, I, I would call this climate delay because it's not really in line with the science, right? The science says gas has some role, but only a very limited and transitioning role. Um, so we can actually build new fossil fuel infrastructure according to the IEA, according to the IPCC, according to many, many um, new studies that have come out recently. 
So continuing to propose those kind of um, approaches to this current crisis is, is, I would argue, a form of climate delay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting point uh, about also responsibility of when you are someone who does not deny climate change, but you, because of your role as a politician, maybe as an expert, you're still going on television, radio, any medium and still expressing an opinion which could not, not necessarily be supportive of any action and instead actually causing a bit of a the opposite of what that's happening. So as, as listeners, maybe we can say, what, what can you suggest as, as maybe being uh, someone receiving that climate delay? What can we realize, okay, wait a minute, that's, that person is sort of saying something that could be true or false or whatever, but it's still not approaching action. It's just a bit of a empty talk or more polit political talk. How can we feel pr part of this narrative instead? Yeah, well, the, the, the important thing to remember with climate delay is that it always has this grain of truth, right? Mm -hmm. So you hear very often arguments in Germany, we're only 2% of global emissions. Oh. Well, it's kind of true. So we are a very small fraction. And, you know, this kind of argument can be used in any context, any industry. So they, in America, they use it, even though they're a significantly larger fraction of global emissions. But you can always say, you know, this action is tiny. What, what, what sense does it make to take this action to spend all this money to, you know, design policy, that kind of thing? Um, and as soon as you hear that, you can you can perhaps understand it as 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 climate delay. The, the the important thing is there's a grain of truth there, but it's overall working against climate action. Another another example is this climate policy will have distributional impacts. It's going to harm. Um, uh, poorer people a little bit more than richer people. These are all important considerations. We should take them into account. In terms of working against them, it's difficult, right? So it's there is a problem of responsibility. We do need to encourage China to, you know, take care of its emissions, just like the United States, just like Brazil and and and, and all of these other major emitters. And the way we do that is by taking responsibility ourselves. So taking actions ourselves and sort of leading the way and reducing the cost of these technologies and showing what good policy can achieve. Um, also in terms of positive social outcomes as well as as well as negative social outcomes. So it's there's no like single solution to dealing with climate delay. You need to be aware of the arguments. Once you once you're aware of them, you can see them out in, in the wild and you can see them being exploited and this kind of thing. And you and you can you know trust yourself that actually you know, it is the right thing to do climate policy. Um, we need to solve this problem, otherwise we'll have horrendous impacts. So I would say um, on the surface, it's, it's a question of understanding them, identifying them, trusting yourself that, 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 that we're taking the right approaches. Yeah. yeah, and realizing that uh, there are some solutions, I guess, uh, that, that need to, uh, that are already present, but sometimes we, we miss out to talk about them properly, like the electric cars. We think that they're the immediate solution, but there are some concerns there, but sometimes we're not really approaching the conversation as, as maybe we should, at least that's my personal impression. One point of the paper that you write, I think it's uh, very important that you write that in some cases there's the obscuring of the highly unequal distribution of climate responsibility worldwide. And um, why do you think that's happening? Do you think it's because we, we either speak too much of local solutions or not um, global, uh, instead it's too hard or how can, how, why is that happening? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always a, a tendency to, to get overwhelmed by the problem. So I'm... <clears throat> you do speak of fear in the paper, which I think is very important. Yeah, fear is, you know, this comes into play when you say, actually, no matter what we do, it's not going to have an effect, right? Which just isn't true according to the climate science. Once we once we stabilize, once we stabilize emissions at net zero, there's no further warming. Um, <clears throat> this is pretty clear from the IPCC Working Group One reports. Um, no, but I, I think on the policy side, there's a tendency to be overwhelmed by you know the scale of the problem and the number of actions and the amount of change um, that needs to take place. So that's a challenge, and I think. You know, we just have to get better at talking about it and deliberating, um, you know, having sort of open democratic means to talk through 
the policies, the implications of those policies, how ambitious we should be, um, what are the kind of effects, can we make some positive effects, um, can we make this a, a positive uh, transition. So climate delay really works against all of all of that. You can throw a normative bomb into the conversation by saying, ah, it's not us, it's China, or us, oh, this is just going to have terrible impacts on, on poor. But you can work through those problems by mm -hmm having having a, an open process um, a democratic process and and um, yeah conference uh, for the future of the European Union so the possibilities that European citizens could uh, organize events and discuss about the EU policies and how those are moving forward and get them back to the EU the uh, headquarters in Italy have been doing some sort of uh, conferences at the moment where they have representatives coming in and discussing uh, what citizens themselves have done so what do you consider that as um, a good democratic form of instrument where people can you know provide their opinion or do you think that that's still a form of um, that's going to die there it has no true maybe impact mm. so I, without knowing too much about this process and actually without knowing anything about it <clears throat> I, I think the the key thing is whether that can translate into into concrete actions and whether that has this sort of legitimacy political legitimacy and bureaucratic legitimacy to actually um um, uh, lead to certain changes on the ground. We have to recognize that there is there are existing processes for designing policy, implementing policy, and um, interest groups have um, influence on those processes at all level, right? So in terms of, you know, um, setting the space for discussion. So what's allowed? What's What are we not allowed to talk about? In terms of direct lobbying, in terms of indirect misinformation, um, propaganda efforts, all all of these, all of these things. So there are vast resources being poured into this, and and um, that's really a battle. You have to you have to fight with those interests, and what they're interested in is protecting themselves, right? So preventing compliance costs for climate policy because they are a heavy industry or they are a fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. um, so I think any kind of bottom-up or, or democratic process needs to recognize that there are those those interests fighting against climate action, and um, should find a way really to to um, delegitimize them, to find entry points to preventing them from um, deploying their different forms of power. And um, I once. I heard a, uh, a statement that in this kind of uh, democratic sphere, you still have to let in things that are not necessarily correct. So those who have a lot of fear and therefore say that climate change is not here. So people who instead deny, uh, what do you consider that form of inclusion into the conversation narrative? Is it necessary at all cost? just because we have to be inclusive of those people, which I think could be fair. However, they're going a bit against uh, the action point of all the efforts put in towards uh, resolving climate change. What, what do you think about this? Well, I think deliberation should be inclusive, but informed. So mm. inclus inclusive in the sense that um, we try to bring along as many people as we can in the process and, and um, actually let them have a, have a say and participate in the process and the decision making, etc but informed insofar as we are really understanding the best science, um, the most um, uh, up-to-date understanding of what solutions are, um, what are the impacts of these different solutions um, in different sectors, in different fields um, from a broad range of expertise. So I think any deliberative, really deliberative democratic forum or decision-making process ought to have both components. So the, the inclusion and the experts um, who can tell you, yeah, this is a good approach, or actually this is not going to get us fast enough uh, where we need to go to, or this kind of policy has these kind of effects. Um, I mean, the IPCC tries to tries to fill some of that gap and there, there, there are, um, <clears throat> you know, the national, um, bodies like the Climate Change Committee in the UK that, that, that sort of fulfills that role. And uh, these things are not perfect, but they, they need to exist, I think, to make sure that we aren't getting totally off track. Thank you very much. For those listening, we are on uh, podcast apps and also on YouTube and social media. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much, William. Thank you.